Well, welcome back to Faces and Places in Fashion. Just a quick refresher of guidelines and for Laura to see as well since it's her first time joining us. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll call on you in order. And if you have an immediate or pressing question, please put it in the chat. And please, please, please turn on your camera when you speak. It just helps us to uh, see who we're talking with. Uh, great job on your fashion event critiques. I am almost finished grading all of them. Of course, my spill on my computer uh, set me back a little bit. I was hoping to be completely finished by today. So if you don't see your grade in there yet, it will be there by the end of the day today. I just wanted to touch on a couple things because obviously you have your midterm coming up and then you'll have your final after that. And a couple of things will carry over. Um, as I hope you can tell from class so far, the purpose of this class is to get you guys excited to enter the industry and thinking about what it's like to be in the industry. And that goes for the assignments as well. So I mean, really what I'm looking for you guys is a thoughtful analysis and a thoughtful response that comes from your point of view. There are typically no wrong answers uh, throughout any of the assignments that I give. It's more just that I want to hear from you and I want to see it professionally written the way you would write an email or the way that you would present, present if you were working. Um, so keep that in mind. Hopefully you can see my comments because I made comments on almost every question or, you know, at least at the end. Uh, and if you can't see them, let me know because I'll, I'll try to figure out why that would be. Um, make sure you take your time, check your proofread your spelling, check your writing. This stuff matters when you're in the industry. It really shows your boss or your client or whoever you're working with um, that you are a thoughtful person who does great work. Um, it comes across in your writing. So keep that in mind as you go forward. Does anyone have questions about this? Or about the fashion event critiques? I love some of your choices. You guys found some really cool events to attend, even in a pandemic, remotely or live, which was really cool. Well, if you want to ask me any questions offline, feel free to shoot me a note and we can connect. Um, reminder on lecture prep questions. Uh, these have been going great. Um, again, I am giving you feedback where I can over email, so if you have further questions about that, please be sure to let me know. A reminder of our social media accounts. We have a Facebook page, a YouTube account, and then you can follow me on Instagram at Prof. Caroline FIT and Twitter, Faces and Places FIT. I've been seeing some of you show up there, which is great. So I can't even believe that we're nearly halfway through the semester, but today we have Laura Wales Holiday joining us, who's a marketing consultant. Uh, she's worked at a number of startups, so I think it's a really great, she's a really great resource for you guys. Even though a lot of you guys are on the more designer front of things and she's marketing, I love that you can talk with her and ask her questions and try to get a feel for what it's like to work with those different departments when you're out there in the field. Um, next week, current issues is due. We will not have class. It will be posted after class today. Then week eight, we have Karen Sabag, uh, who's a designer for Karen Sabag New York, a bridal wear designer. Then spring break, and then Z Zaida Musa will be joining us. She's design director for Betsy Johnson Kids in GW Industries. The week after will be Demetra Williams, who's founder and CEO of her own company, as well as a designer at Helmut Lang. Um, Bijou Abiola will be joining us on April 19th, director of consumer insights and strategy at L'Oreal. And then Awana Botez, another costume designer, will be coming uh, in on week 12 for theater and opera and dance. So a little bit of a different angle than we saw last week with Katie Irish, because she's a little bit more of the live performance. And week 13 will be Rachel Landy, who's vice president of global merchandising at Kate Spade. And last but not least, Fashion Services Network will be the last panel that we have of class. Marsha, did you have a question? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. I wanted to ask about the midterm that we have. I think it's coming up mm -hmm. next week. Was there a specific um, um, briefing on what exactly we're supposed to do that was might have been posted? So the midterm is based on the State of Fashion 2021, which is posted on Blackboard under, under content. And you should read that before starting. It's okay. As it says, it's the state of fashion 2021. It talks about all the big global issues that are impacting fashion, and it surveys a number of people in the industry and out of the industry. And um, it's a really great baseline for you guys to understand what the big macro issues are in the world right now for fashion. And then my questions are all based around that, and they're due. It's going live tonight at 6 p.m., and you have to finish it by 6 p.m. next Monday evening, the 15th. 
So you're posting the questions tonight? Yep. As oh. soon as this class is over, they'll be out. They'll be live. Yeah, I didn't see anything about the questions before. That's why I was wondering what we're supposed to do with the article. Um, oh. The article. The article is live though. You, you yeah, saw I saw the article. I just didn't know what we're supposed to do with it. Okay. Thank you. Well, awesome. All right. Well, with that, I want to introduce you guys to Laura. Um, Laura Wales Holiday is joining us from uh, as a marketing consultant. Sorry, I'm pulling up her bio, but my computer is being weird. <laughs> I'm happy to introduce myself if you want. <laughs> um, oh, I see what's happening. Sorry. Uh, no, I just wanted to read your bio. Um, sorry. I don't know why this is not functioning on me. I'm not, this is not my technology week. Um, <laughs> there you go. Why don't I just take it if it's not, if it's not coming up? I don't. What? Go ahead. Introduce yourself. This will be a first. <laughs> so, hi everyone. I'm so delighted to be here with you and chat tonight about a couple of topics. Um, I have been in marketing for a long time, and specifically with startups. So I started my career um, at Williams-Sonoma, well, a little bit before that, but let's just skip to Williams-Sonoma, uh, where I was the website manager, went to business school, came back to Williams-Sonoma, Pottery Barn as the director of e-commerce. Then I went to Ralph Lauren, where I was for four years as first director and then vice president of marketing for digital. And after that, I moved to J. Crew, uh, also doing marketing. And after two years there, I moved to Rent the Runway, where I was chief marketing officer. And after about a year and a half there, I moved to Zola, where I was also chief marketing officer. Unfortunately, after two years of that, I moved to London because my husband's job was moved. And while I was devastated to leave Zola, I've had an amazing three years so far in London. And I've been working with a company called Depop for the past uh, little over three years as a marketing consultant, as well as a few other startups. Show of hands, who's familiar with Depop? Lots, lots, lots. Okay, about, got about half of you. Um, in another class that I was teaching, actually it came up several times as people's favorite place to shop. So great. Very, I feel like very relevant in this, um, in this group, which is great. <laughs> Fantastic. So I guess um, I'll start off by asking a little bit more about marketing in a more traditional role. So at somewhere like Ralph Lauren, can you tell them a little bit about what a, an entry level job would look like for someone in marketing at a corporation? Sure. Well, I think the important thing to understand is that marketing is a big umbrella that encompasses a lot of different kinds of roles. So marketing can mean everything from being someone who sends out the emails to customers could be someone who's running paid search ads, someone who's in charge of brand marketing, like how we come across to the brand, um, and somebody who's running public relations, trying to get us press articles. So it's really a wide variety, and it depends on sort of where you wind up as an entry-level job, what your responsibilities are. So if you came in sort of as a brand marketer, a lot of what you would be doing was figuring out the advertising scheme, both for like big things, whether it was a New York Times ad or an out of home ad, all the way down to sort of what does the mailer look like when it goes out to, to customers. But then there are some jobs that are quite data heavy. So if you came in and you were in digital marketing, you might be expected to do a lot of modeling in Excel. So it's actually a very wide variety of both skill sets and requirements once you're in the role. Great. Um, Kayla, did you have a question or is it just a lingering hand from before? Okay, if you're talking, we can't hear you. So um, I guess so. <laughs> uh, Chu Yun, did you have a question? Uh, no. Okay, just from before. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so how did you get your first job out of college? Yeah, so mine's, mine's not very interesting in that I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to be a journalist. 
And I wasn't exactly sure how to just go about doing that. So I went through campus recruiting and wound up, um, as many people do who don't know what they want to be, as a consultant for like a big consulting company. And that taught me a few really important things. One, I did not want to do that. It was a really quite boring, tedious role. Um, but it was really valuable in that it taught me basically to get my act together. I think in college I had sort of floated through and most of the classes I had taken were not that challenging. I wasn't pulling all nighters. I was having a lot of fun and I wasn't, I wasn't the most efficient person that you'd ever met. And when I became a consultant and worked with these people that were just sort of like worked at a totally different level, what they expected from me at 22 was such a high degree of professionalism that it really taught me to like work hard, work efficiently, get stuff done in a way that I never had had done before. Yeah. That's great to pick up pieces along the way, even if it ends up being different from your eventual path. Absolutely. Love that. Um, is there anything that you would have done differently in college to prepare you for the path you have or even that first job out of school? You know, I think that the things I would have done different in college are the same things that I would just do differently in life. Like I would have spent less time caring about what people thought of me. I would have spent less time worrying about things that I couldn't control. Uh, I probably would have studied a little harder and perhaps socialized a little less, but it all worked out. Um, <laughs> and honestly, while there were some classes that I can remember that really motivated me and stuck with me and those were good lessons, I think one of the most valuable things that I did in college was that I waitressed nights at a 24-hour really high volume diner. And it taught me organization. It taught me how to get along with people from all walks of life. And it's actually how I sort of thought maybe I, maybe consulting would be okay for me because I was constantly thinking like, this isn't organized well, like the plate should be over here for maximum efficiency. And, um, but, but that experience was almost just as valuable as a lot of the classes that, that I've taken. So it's really like, where can you learn the lessons that you need? even if it's not, because it's so easy today. Like when I went to school, we didn't really have like internet the way it is today. And so that God, that makes me feel so old. Um, but nowadays you can look up how to do anything or, you know, or you can watch a YouTube video on how to learn, you know, an Excel function, but you, you really need to learn how to teach yourself, how to get along in life. Like what you can do to motivate yourself. So those were important skills. Yeah, that's great. Um, and then you did go back and get your MBA. And um, I don't know if you could tell us about that experience and how, how you made the decision, how you feel like it impacted you. Yeah, I made the experience. I made the decision because at the time I had been in e-commerce for a while, um, and I was like a product manager but I really wanted to get into pure marketing. And I thought that I wanted to do marketing for a CPG company, a con like a Clorox or a L'Oreal or a consumer packaged goods company, because that's what's known as like the purest form of marketing. So I applied to business school. I wasn't sure where I could get in. I wound up going for two years. It was probably two of the best years of my life. It was amazing. I loved every bit of it. Um, and I did my summer internship at L'Oreal doing CPG marketing. And actually what that taught me was that that wasn't what I wanted to do because coming from retail where the pace is really fast, I found it frustrating to work for a company where the whole summer, the only thing I did was plan one piece of a lipstick that was going to be released the next year. Yeah. Where the retail, it was just something happening every day. There's drops all the time. So it was very yeah. fast paced and you could see the results of what you were doing much more quickly. Yeah. Um, but in terms of getting my MBA, I thought it was great and I enjoyed it a lot more than college. And the reason why, a few things. One, at that point I'd been in the workforce for a few years and 
not to depress you, but once you get in the workforce after college and you realize like it's kind of a grind <laughs> um, and you realize you may not have enjoyed college as much as you should have or appreciated it rather, when you go back for any kind of graduate program and have like a break from work just to concentrate on studying, you really appreciate it. Like it feels very precious. Um, and then just the opportunity to meet amazing people and build those lasting connections um, was really, really special. That's great. Um, and then you've worked some, for some awesome startups from Rent the Runway and, and Zola and now consulting with Depop. Can you tell us what it's like working for a startup? Yes. So it was, it was really a big shift going from a large company to a startup. Um, I think one, one situation that sort of encapsulates it was, you know, coming from Ralph Lauren and J. Crew, those are very like brand precious companies. So especially at Ralph Lauren, we wouldn't do something unless it was very good. Like if something didn't, if something wouldn't meet with Ralph's approval, it generally wouldn't happen. Yeah. So, you know, we weren't just throwing stuff together. However, when I went to rent the runway on my second week there, I sat down with one of the, the co-founders, Jenny, and she said, okay, so we need to talk because Bergdorf Goodman is going to let us have a shop in shop in their store and we can rent dresses from their store. It's such an amazing opportunity, but we have to be live there in two weeks. And my reaction was like, oh man, that's such a shame. Like, what a bummer that we didn't get more time. Could we try to renegotiate with them for next year? And she sort of looked at me funny and said, oh no, 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 I'm sorry. Let me explain. We're launching in two weeks. So now we need to come up with a plan for sort of like every hour between now and the two week launch of how we're going to make this happen. And that was such a shock for me because it was something we never would have done at Ralph Lauren because we wouldn't have had time to get it perfect. And that's like the biggest change with startups is you just get stuff done in a quick amount of time and it's kind of fast and dirty. And if it's not perfect, that's okay. You do the best you can and then you move on. And so it was much more of a do what you think is right. If it turns out not to be right, move on to the next thing. Whereas at big companies, there's so much planning to go into every step of the way. Um, it's like you're building your brand image rather than maintaining your brand image. So it's, it's a very different. Yes, it's very different. <laughs> yes, yes. That's really it, cool. Yeah. And um, a fun, I feel like a really fun place to be, especially with the takeoff that they have had. <laughs> Rent the runway, in particular. Yes. Um, Rent the runway is a really tough environment. Um, a lot of turnover. Oh, yeah. um, and and could be challenging at times, but obviously an amazing company that has really revolutionized the way people think about their wardrobe. So I was really excited to be a part of that. Yeah. Great. And then um, and Zola. Yeah. Um, so Zola is like my dream job. I absolutely loved it. Does everyone know what Zola is? It's a, it's a like a wedding company. So it started out just as a wedding registry, online wedding registry, um, and now it's sort of expanded and it's wedding websites and it's wedding this and that and the other and RSVPs. Um, and when I joined, it was 30 people, um, so it's quite small. And but when I left, it was like. 150 something like that um, so we grew a lot just in those two years and one of the things that was so great about Zola was when I started um, I, I sat next to the CEO the founder Shan and I think the marker of like a good leader is that they trust the people that they hire and so I remember turning to Shan one day and saying, Shan, I want to throw a dog wedding. And she said, okay. And I said, like a big dog wedding. Like it's going to take a chunk of our budget. Like this is going to be a big bet. Like we're going to throw a dog wedding. And she's like, okay, great. And I said, well, do, do you have any questions? And she said, well, 
what is the date? I just want to make sure I can come. <laughs> and I thought that that was amazing because I remember we did like a virtual dog show at Ralph Lauren and it, it, there were 20 people in the room for every single meeting. It was probably pre-meetings and meetings. The whole thing took about two and a half months just to approve. And then at Zola, it was like, okay, I'm going to go do this now. You sure? Any last thoughts? Okay, I'm go and, and, and we just did it and we, we pulled it off and it, it wound up being amazing. And the Real Housewives of New York came to the wedding and it was on TV. It was amazing. But um, just having that freedom to go do things and take risks that you wouldn't be able to do in a large company. That's great. Um, I feel like I've had people talk about that too, that uh, strong leaders of startups kind of know what they don't know and then just realize they just need to rely on the experts that they, that they brought in and hired to kind of run with things. Yes. Oh, sounds like it was a good fit for that. <laughs> um, so tell us a bit about what marketing looks like for a fashion line. You've talked, you talked a little bit before about how it can differ across uh, roles within a company, but how is it different you know, with a Zola versus a Ralph Lauren or J. Crew. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're very similar in that they're both, like, they're lifestyle brands. They're aspirational. They're about improving your life in some way. So your wedding is a very aspirational time, what you wear, how you decorate your home. So they actually have a more in common than, than not, I would say. Um, one of the differences is just actually around the timing of things. So fashion lines things as you know change very quickly and you have seasons and you have you know drops within seasons and so it's a constant onslaught where in the home lines uh, rollouts are much slower so you don't have sort of new fresh products all the time the way you do for for fashion so that changes the pace of marketing mm. um but again it, it it's interesting i think because you guys are, are at FIT and, and a lot of you are, want to be designers and merchants, like that is so specific to fashion, right? But from a marketing perspective, depending on what kind of marketing you're doing, a lot of it almost doesn't matter what you're marketing. It's the same kind of tactics and strategies that you would use for anything. And um, a long time ago, it was at cooking.com, like the first dot com boom. And uh, when it went under, like they all did, um, I was hired at Williams Sonoma. And I remember when I went there and they said, oh, it's so, you know, it was such a perfect fit having you join because you were already at a cooking company and blah, blah. And I just remember thinking, that's weird. That's a weird way to think about it. Like the marketing that I do, it doesn't matter whether I'm marketing like a hammer or, or, you know, a kitchen aid. It's the same strategies. It's the same tactics and it's the same channels. Um, so I'd say in general marketing, whether it's a fashion line or not matters less. That being said, obviously like having that, um, that aesthetic, having the understanding of the customer and what they want, is super important because while marketers rely a lot on the designers and the merchants to tell them like here's our big bets here's what we know these are the things that we want you to push it is like marketing does have we have tools in our belt to say well actually hang on a second because while you are saying that red socks are going to be the item for for fall what we're seeing is actually that it's purple gloves or whatever and having a sort of healthy discussion about like what the designers and merchants see in their friends versus what the consumer is actually desiring and finding that marriage and what is the right mix because it's always a mix right like the way to optimize Ralph Lauren's bank account would just be to constantly market polo shirts because it's the biggest seller, it's huge margin. But obviously if you just kept marketing the polo shirts, then they wouldn't be worth as much because you would lose the brand and that value. So finding that marriage of how do we optimize for what the customer is asking for versus how do we tell the customer what to ask for 
is is very interesting. Yeah. What, in what ways are, ha, do you interact with a customer, or did you at Ralph Lauren or J Crew? Yeah. So some of it is is just what we see in the data, right? So um, we will take a hundred different Facebook ads and put them all out at the same time, advertising different products with different text and different messaging, and then see what is interacted with the most and what makes the most purchases. So that's one way. Um, so that's more, more data-driven. And also just looking at the web analytics and where people are clicking and how they're navigating the site. You know, are they stopping to look at what's featured in the hero, or are they immediately searching for publisher. Um, and then, so that's one way. The other way is we do a lot of surveys to understand the customer better. And we didn't do this as much at Ralph Lauren, but certainly at the Runway and Zola and Depop, just a ton of focus groups, both of people who use us, people who have considered using us but don't, and then people who I've never heard of us and people who have actively said that they won't shop with us and really understanding like what's the difference between those four profiles and are we going for the right target on this is is really important and um so to give an example um do you guys remember rugby which was it was a ralph lauren brand and you remember it it was around for yeah. <laughs> maybe seven years maybe -ish. you were in the city it was 12th and university location there were, there were a few stores <laughs> yeah yeah uh, and online yeah. and it was um it was a very specific aesthetic and it was something that ralph loved and david loved and something that a very core group of Ralph Lauren aficionados absolutely fell in love with. But I don't think that there was enough analysis and real understanding of the customer to get that that wasn't a viable business. The price point on those items, where we needed to have the stores, and how many people wanted that very specific aesthetic just didn't line up to make a profitable business. And it was it was never profitable until eventually it, it had to close. Yeah. And so I think that's a, that's an example to me of a time when we didn't pay enough attention to the customer, where it was it was Ralph Lauren saying, this is what you should want. And if some people say, great, we want that, but not a big enough group. And and I don't think that there was enough time spent on actually sizing and doing the research to understand whether that was going to work or not. Yeah, that's great. This is a, I, I don't actually believe I, I told you this question in advance, so hopefully it's not putting you on the spot, but do you have any advice for how to be a great designer or merchant working with a marketing partner? You know, what someone you've worked with that did a great job at it. That was really great at working with you that you would recommend as, as they go off into the world? That's interesting, and I did not see that question that yeah. you asked. Me, so. right. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, you know, I've been really lucky that most of the, the merchants and designers that I've gotten to work with have been really fantastic and great partners. Um, but I think it, it, it there are a couple things that make that partnership work really well. So it's sort of having the common alignment that your two goals are to elevate the brand and make money. And that there's always gonna be friction between those two things, and that every decision you make is likely gonna involve a trade-off on one or the other. And that you kind of have to do like, you win this one, I win that one, you win this one, I win that one. And not to say that the marketers are always the ones saying we want to make money, because certainly sometimes we're advocating for the brands and the merchants are asking, I just want to make money. Um, but sort of having that healthy dialogue and not always going to the mat for everything, because it's not always going to be one or the other. If you if you live a, live a life where it's just about elevating the brand every step of the way, you wind up with a rugby. 
But if you're always trying to just optimize for the bottom line, then you go the way of so many people that just go out of business. So having that really health, healthy debate um, between the merchants and, and marketing. I mean, I could turn that around and ask you the same question. Yeah. Oh, that is a good question. Um, you know, I was going to say that my impression in working with marketing is that generally speaking, they're usually good protectors of the brand and not as obsessed with how many things we own in a really big way. I remember there were times in my career where we'd be marketing a jacket we own 12 units of throughout the whole country. Um, <laughs> but you know, it was the most elevated looking piece and it was beautiful. And hey, those 12 units would sell out in like a day, but um, you know, it, it created a halo for the brand. So, um, so yeah, I think, I think you're, I, you're totally right in the partnership and, and having those dialogues early on to say, Hey, these are the things we really own a lot of, like, let's, let's push this, this topic, you know, keeping in mind what's going to look nice and elevate the brand at the same time. So. Yeah. And I think having like, good brainstorms on if this is what we own deeply is there a way that we can talk about this in a more elevated way yeah ahead of the time like can we build into a good story around this that we could could tell rather than because yes we we absolutely have marketed product where we owned one right or it never got made <laughs> um that's great so uh You've worked in a couple of different places, and, and obviously I'm talking to you now in London. So uh, one of my topics this year, because we are so fortunate, I mean, look, we're remote. It's not the most fortunate thing in the world, but I'm usually very tied to who's available and, and in New York City. So mm -hmm. I love hearing different perspectives on different cities and personalities of those cities as a work-life balance culture. Yeah. Um, I would say London in general has uh, – a much better work-life balance, um, even in the startup realm. Uh, just much more openness to flexibility, to different kinds of work arrangements. Um, so I, I really found that to be nice after that. Like New York's pretty intense. Like you have to be there. You have to be in the office five days a week. You have to be working full time all the time. And uh, in London's just not doesn't quite have that that attitude and obviously like lots more vacation lots more turning off on the weekends um which is good it also has um it's also just a bit edgier and um like humor that works in the uk doesn't work in the us and vice versa i mean it really is <laughs> you know separated by the same language, like two nations separated by the same language, yeah. um, because things just are, are, are actually quite different. Um, I would also say that the talent is not as good here. So one of the things I do for, for Depop is to try to help them build out their teams. And um, there just aren't as many um, really skilled merchants and designers and marketers in London as there are in New York. Oh, wow. So yeah. if someone does come from New York and has those great skills, they will be in very high demand. Yeah. Oh, that's good to know. Um, and how, how do you feel like sustainability is finding its way into the marketing world? Do you think that's an important message or is it? Yeah. I mean, it's been... It's so amazing watching the past few years and what a turnaround this has been. I mean, from H&M and Zara ruling the world now to like companies like Depop really being the next big thing. It's been, a, it's been so great. And it's really, you know, it's about Gen Z and just the belief that like owning secondhand is of course the right thing to do. And that's, it's, it's so different from it being a little like, ooh, we don't want to do that. Or even when I joined Rent the Runway, there was a lot of, oh, I wouldn't want to wear something that someone else has worn and like kind of an ew factor. Yeah. Um, that's just been completely now accepted um, by, by the world. Now, I think it's still an emerging trend and it's not close to where it will be. Um, and the fashion industry still has so much work to do in terms of its environmental footprint. But the fact that so many people now are buying secondhand, that so many companies are now understanding that they need to be buying back their product and reselling it, 
um, and the companies and industries are springing up around that to help them do that is is amazing. And one of the nice things about working for for Depop um, is that we could sit on our hands, we could do no marketing, and we would still grow because the total pie of how many people are our buying secondhand is just growing and growing and growing every year. And so it's not just, you know, buying secondhand, it's renting, it's how clothing is made. So I absolutely love the trend, but I really think it's like the past just two years to me is where it became like a vector kind of change, yeah. um, especially in terms of how the media has approached it. Yeah, definitely. I feel it in my class too. I mean, I feel like, um, you know, when I first started teaching at FIT, it was a topic dabbled in, but now it, all the students are very passionate about the topic. Yeah. Um, this class and other classes as well. You know, it's a, it's a change in mentality for the whole generation. I think exactly. It's just great. Um, I think I'm going to make sure I give enough time for students. And I know that you have, um, you have a piece that you want to close with too. And, and I want to be mindful of the fact that you are, a lot later than us too, but if, what would be your number one piece of advice for anyone who is entering into the marketing field or wants to enter into the marketing field? I would say even if you're a super creative person, even if you're a designer, um, spend some time gaining analytical skills. Even if you think you're not going to use them. Uh, it's so important. Today, just everything is data driven. Everything is it, it, you need to know how to, to how to talk that way and think that way. Even if it's not part of your everyday job, you're going to be in meetings with people who think that way and your ability to meet them on that level will do you well. So learn how to use Excel really well. Learn how to read financial statements. Learn how to uh, how to like model things out. Um, because I know for any of the roles at Depop, um, even like the most creative brandy ones, if you don't have at least some of that skill, you wouldn't be considered for a job. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And actually, students, in a couple of weeks, um, I will, I'll take you through kind of like very um, Cliff Notes version for selling reports for designers so that you can look at the Monday morning reports that your buyers will send around to you or whoever will send around to you and you can actually just read it. You don't have to create it. You don't have to know the math super well, but you have to understand what the numbers mean so that you as a designer can be more thoughtful and um, create better. Because to your point, I mean, it's important that you're hearing the customer and the ultimate way to hear the customer is what they're actually voting for on the selling floor. So it's great. Well, I would love to see a show of hands for some questions. Amber, you want to go first? Oops. Amber, if you want to go uh, first? Yeah, then. yeah. Um, I was just turning on my camera. Sorry. Uh, can you see me fine? Yeah. Yes. All right. Hi. Yeah. So, um, first of all, thanks for uh, coming on here. I'm really happy to hear like um about all this uh, sustainability stuff. And I'm I never really bought from Depop but I am planning on doing so. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, so what would you say are some very common misconceptions people have about like Depop in general and the whole thrifting um, side of the fashion industry? Like what, what do you think that you would want people to have like cleared up about it? Good question. I think, Unfortunately, the things that I want to clear up are things that I could never guarantee would be cleared up. So, for instance, some of the things that people worry about when buying secondhand are quality, cleanliness, shipping actually showing up, you're buying from a peer, like what's going to happen. And I wish I could say, don't worry, it's all going to work smoothly. And unfortunately, it's not. So whenever you are on, like Depop is not a retailer. It's a peer-to-peer -peer platform. So whenever you're dealing with a peer-to-peer -peer platform, there is inherently going to be a, a problem. So most transactions go out with no problem. I've bought on Depop many times. I've never had a problem. Um, but a lot of the people that sell on Depop are students who are doing this sort of 
just part time to make a little extra cash. So like if you buy from them, they may not ship your product the next day the way you would expect from like other companies or maybe it's a little bit more worn than you thought it was going to be. Um, those right. kinds of things happen. Now the majority of sellers are fabulous and it, it's actually interesting when I, when I joined Depop, one of the things that I brought up was, well, wouldn't we want every buyer, like wouldn't we want to market to every buyer to get them to sell? Like, okay, you bought this, now go clear out your, your wardrobe and you sell too, because that would just increase the total pie. And, and I was surprised to learn, hmm, actually not necessarily, because it's really the people who do this in a more professional capacity that's where we don't have customer service issues. Like people who do this as a real part of their job or even their full-time job that are professional, they're making sure everything works accordingly. Like that's where it's all good. The rest of the time, like there can be issues. Like there's an there's a Instagram um, handle, it's Depop Drama. And uh, it's not affiliated with Depop. And now it's become so big that people like, make stuff up to put on there or like you know fake right. interaction on there but certainly some of them are real and it gives you a taste for all the issues that you do encounter on a peer-to-peer -peer, um site but what i think is really great um like the, the thing that makes me happiest when i look at depop is finding people who are more like creators and designers who are taking old clothes and putting their own spin on them and selling them from a design point of view rather than just like, oh, I bought this cheap over here or my grandma gave it to me and now I want to get rid of it for some cash. Um, mm -hmm. That's what I think is the most exciting part of Depop. All right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that, that was all, but thank you for answering. That cleared it up, yeah. Great. Thanks, Amber. Um, Laura, I guess I, quick, a question for you on Depop. Why do you feel like it's, been more successful or you know it's grown so much more rapidly than say eBay like what what do you think they're doing so much better that people don't, didn't want to go to eBay I think eBay has gotten so big and now they, they're overrun with um, bulk buyers and sellers from China honestly like if you yeah. look for something that's that's the majority of what you're finding you're it's harder to find someone in your area that happens to have that pair of shoes that's now sold out that you want um it's be, it's become too big uh mm -hmm. it's also not specialized and it's not um it, they really haven't evolved how they work at all partly by design like the way craigslist still looks like craigslist um but their their population is just aging so much so if you look at someone like a poshmark that's a closer example to to depop um and it has grown really rapidly um, Depop sort of is going after a similar demographic, but not exactly. So where Poshmark is more people who um, are shopping the high street. Is that is that a U.S. term or just the U.K. term? No, yeah, I think so. Okay. Sometimes yeah. I can't remember which. Um, and you know, you're going to get a lot more like Zara resells and J. Crew resells, um, and it's a little bit more millennial. And then Depop is very Gen Z. It's much more um, street water and designer and vintage. Um, so it's just, it is, they are both growing really rapidly in part because they're targeting different demographics. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, Justin, I see you next. Hello, how are you doing? Hey, Justin. Um, so my question was, I kind of wanted to just know your opinion on social media influencers and how they contributed to the growth of Depop. And I'd also like to know um, which kind of had has more buying power as far as like the influencers or like running marketing ads. That is such a good question. Um, so with Depop, because our because the people who are selling are then marketing their shops on social, they are our biggest source of inbound traffic, right? So whether or not that you could call them an influencer, 
someone creates a shop on Depop just to make money, they're going to go push it out to their friends to bring people in. Um, so that is that is by far the biggest the biggest source of inbound customers. So I would say to answer your question really succinctly, influencers are more important. That being said, we need more buyers than influencers can attract in order to like make the, make it work, like make them sell enough to keep selling on Depop. And so from that perspective, that's where marketing comes in, in a wide variety of ways. Um, and a lot of it is also about retention. So it, with Depop, it's interesting. And it's partly just because Gen Z doesn't necessarily have a lot of buying power yet. Um, the monthly active users, the amount of people that open Depop and scroll Depop multiple times a day is huge. It's just huge. But it's only a small percent of those people that actually buy. So a lot of our marketing efforts are actually focused on all those people that we already we already acquired them somehow, whether it was influencers or paid search or whatever, we already have them, but they're not actually buying. So what can we do to get them over that hurdle to get them to actually make that first purchase and make that second purchase? Um, that's a, a, a big part of, of the marketing efforts as well. And I will say, in, in specifically on influencers, like. Depop reaches out to a lot of people who we think are influencers and tries to get them to, to sell on Depop. Um, and everywhere from just like, hey, introducing them to Depop and motivating them to do it all the way for big influencers to be like, we will run your shop for you. You don't have to do anything. But the ones that, and some of them we pay, but the ones that we pay do not perform as well as the ones that are just naturally work and that's the same with almost every company and like if you have to pay someone to talk about your product it's not going to work that well because they're going to talk about it once and then it's going to get buried in their feed and that's going to be it so um in general you have to be very like having authentic relationships with your influencers is much better than just having a contract for sure thank you thanks uh hawa i have you next Uh, give me a second to come back camera. Hi. Hey, so um, I have a few questions. Um, thinking back on what Justin was asking when you mentioned about the um, influencers, I've learned recently that like when you even reach out to influencers, they're not obligated to even like post your work, even if you pay them, like they're not obligated to like post right away. They can post them whenever they want. Other um except for the fact that if you if you hire somebody to be a part of your marketing team or to be a promoter, then they will do it frequently. Is that right? Is that how you see it from your depop end? It's a little it's a little more confusing than that, but um mm -hmm. There's lots of different ways that you can set up a contract with an influencer. There's mm -hmm. everything from we like a lot of times if you see a um, a supermodel or who is uh, has their own cosmetics brand or something, mm -hmm. or is a spokesperson for a cosmetic brand. A lot of the times, what's happened is a company has started a cosmetics brand, mm -hmm. and what they do is they give a piece of the company to that spokesperson. Okay. So they might give them 5% of the company okay. rather than like paying them a fee for each time they post. Mm -hmm. And then that person is invested in the success of the company because obviously the bigger company gets more money they make. And so they might post more. But it's all about how you structure the contract. I mean, you can make a contract that says you post on these dates mm -hmm. and this is what you post. And yes, you have creative control over what you say, but this is what we expect in terms of imagery and da da da. Mm -hmm. um, or it can be more generic. Um, and a, a lot of um, a, a lot of what people do in terms of like getting people involved in the company, it's not even just for marketing. So so a CEO 
might have their board of directors, which maybe they don't have a lot of choice in because it's about their investors, but they might create like a board of advisors and give them each like a little piece of the company as well. And those are people who they know have good connections to other people or can help out because they have, you know, they're international and you want to expand internationally. So there's lots of ways to sort of structure those relationships depending on what you want to get out of them. Okay, cool. Um, that's yeah. for a beginning stage and when you're trying to budget yourself so that you're not, because I, I own a company too. Um, it's okay. brand new. So like, um, I'm just learning as I go, especially with the marketing. Um, I even like, especially on Clubhouse, I don't even know if you heard of Clubhouse yet. Yeah. We have, and I love it so much. I've been on Clubhouse every weekend and it's a really good place to like talk to millionaires. Um, they have like groups where you can talk about your business and yeah. you're just making friends or acquaintances as you go and you're shouting out your business and they teach you things like I was a part of this one group two weekends ago and now I'm a part of like a, a room you know when they, uh -huh. they put you in a room like you're one of the moderators I'm part of a room and she was telling me to use fiber because fiber is a place where you can meet freelance workers and through that she helped me find certain people that can really help my business grow even though it's a beginner startup like with the help of somebody outside of my company and I'm paying them they can really push my like push my agrilum and then when I look at my Instagram insights, it can reach out more people because I'm struggling with getting more people to buy. I don't really care for likes. And that's the thing that people confuse. Likes don't really matter. My, likes are not buying your product and it's not paying your bills. So um, I don't know that it's a lot, but I have another question. Oh yeah, so what kind, so for Depop, how, you, how are you guys like reaching out to demographics? Like, are you guys international or do you think it's only for English speaking countries? Um, so we are international, mm -hmm. uh, but we started with you. It's it's very big in the UK. It's much bigger in the UK than it is in the US. Mm -hmm. um, in part because there's not competitors here. Like there's not posh market. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and in the US, in Australia, and mm -hmm. now France, Germany. Like we are expanding into Europe now, and with plans for Asia. Like we we are expanding, but we're expanding very slowly. Um, the one thing I would, I would say, it's great that you're meeting all of these people who can help you with your business mm -hmm. and every founder needs help with their business. Be careful. Okay. I, there are trillions of people out there who mm -hmm. have something to sell you mm -hmm. about the way that they're going to improve your business. Mm -hmm. And you meet them at Clubhouse or they reach out to you just, you know, cold call, like, you had you just be always go into a conversation where, where somebody wants you to pay them to help your business with your mm -hmm. skeptical eyes on. Don't be mm -hmm. grateful for that conversation. Be skeptical mm -hmm. of what they can offer. Make well, she sure was just putting me on to Fiber. Like she introduced Fiber the app to me. Did that? Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, no, no. I'm just th that's oh, kind. Of right. If someone's trying to school me or something, right? Okay, okay, I get it. Just that that who there are so many different people out there who mm -hmm. will help you and there are so many people out there who will say that they'll help you and they'll kind of help you and it's not even from from being like bad people or anything it's just mm -hmm. that not every solution is built for every business mm -hmm. and um and and part of that is just like it just takes time to know like when i when I've been at, at companies, the, the the people on my teams who are more junior, they get all these inbound requests, marketing requests. Oh, can we tell you about this great thing that we can do to improve your email marketing? Can we tell you about blah, blah, blah? Mm -hmm. They would send them to me. And honestly, it's just like time that I can say like, nope, that nope, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I so I, I, that's not very helpful except to say just always rethink before you write anyone a check. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, definitely. I've been interviewing. Sorry. Hold on. Sorry. I don't answer lines. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So um, I've been interviewing them for the last two weeks now and like asking them like, hello, do you do this? How can you help my brand? And then some of them have been sending me like Excel sheets with like big brands like Adidas. And I'm like, that doesn't prove to me that you can help my brand because I'm not the same as Adidas or any of the other brands on your Excel sheet. And when I spoke to another um, social media manager, she told me that each brand is not the same. And what I'm, what my um, motto or what is it called? My brand, what is it? I think you guys know the word I'm trying to say. My brand's message is not the same as anybody else's. So 
I'm targeting a specific kind, so they can't really compare me to anybody else. That's and true. yeah, so I feel like when it even comes to like going on Instagram, trying to get your targeted audience, because Instagram is the main point plus Facebook, but it's really hard just to get um, to mark yourself. Like you can constantly post, you can do the reels, you can do the um the story the stories and lives, but it's not. I don't know what's missing to help companies grow. Do you know? Did, is that too much? No, it's not. I mean, no, it's not. It's just it's just really hard to answer without in the business. Um, mm -hmm. In general, if you were a small business, mm -hmm. an agency is not going to be a good solution for you especially an agency that deals with Adidas because okay. you are going to be like a tiny minnow in their big sea of whales and mm -hmm. you're going to get zero attention. You'll get the worst people in the agency put on your account. Mm -hmm. What I would do if I were you, mm -hmm. there are a ton of really great freelancers out there, even ones that work at social media agencies that want a little extra cash mm -hmm. and Find someone who will just work on an hourly basis with no contract. So mm -hmm. give them a, you know, one week, see what they can do for you. If you like them, keep them. If not, don't. Mm -hmm. I'm working with a very early stage startup right now. And I have a great woman in London who's like 20 and works as a social media agency. And she does our social media for us for $10 an hour. Okay. And she's doing a great job. <laughs> we went with an agency. They'd want like a minimum $5,000 ret retainer every month. And it's just, if you're a small business, don't use an agency. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I think she was lying. Cause I think some people try to scam on these apps, like especially these business apps and try to make it seem like, Oh, I work for this big brand and I work for this big brand. I can get you as a client. And it's like, but you're not answering all my questions. I'm interviewing you and you're not answering my questions. We yeah, just have to be smart yeah. about it. Right. Yeah. As, a, as an entrepreneur, right? Yeah. Thank you so much. I don't want to take up your time. I know it's going to happen. And I also, I connected with you on LinkedIn, by the way. I was being a little okay. stalker. But um, when you get the chance, you can, like, you know, co um, connect back with me if you want. My name sure. is on the screen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jacqueline, I have you next. Hello. Hi, um, so I really love Depop. It's one of my favorite places to shop, but I've never actually sold anything on there and I've been thinking about it. Um, so I was just curious to hear your perspective on why you think selling on Depop is better than rather like starting your own website and selling on there. I mean, it's just the built in audience, right? If you start your own website, how are you going to get people there? Right. Yeah. Other than, other than the network that you already have. And if you think you can sell it with the network you already have, that's great. Like put it on Instagram or whatever, that, then don't bother because they'll take 10%. But it's really about you probably just need to have access to a wider variety of people that would be interested in your stuff. And that's why you use a company like Depop. Okay. Thank you. Caleb, I have you next. I'm just turning on my camera right now. Yeah, no Hi. Hi, Hi. Okay, so I have a few questions. Um, I am actually planning on moving to London at the end of this year. So I was just kind of wondering, like, what is um, kind of the environment right now with, like, COVID and everything, as well as, like, what is if you have any advice for someone who like would be like first entering the business right now in this kind of new age in, in London. Yeah. I mean, COVID's been hard. We're just like, England is different than the U S and that there's just like national policy. So we have been on strict lockdown for the past like three months, like, can't leave your house except for an approved reason. Um, so that's starting to ease though. Um, yeah, I saw your schools are reopening. That was on the news. Yes, they opened today. It was the best day. Very. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so 
it's been like there hasn't been a whole lot going on honestly it's been very like hunkered down but because vaccinations are going really fast and stuff the plan is that by summer actually people will be back in the offices like depop will have their offices open by the summer um so i think it's speeding up and but i would try to get as many conversations started ahead of time before you move um just like laying the groundwork and because i did I, like i do i do consulting and i do consulting at depop which is a, a uk firm but almost all the other consulting i do is still based in the us because it's hard to just create a new network in a totally different country even if you know a few people or, or what have you until you you've been there a while so as much as you can get conversations going before you move i would say do that okay how how would you recommend that? Would you, um, I guess that that's kind of a lead on question. I've, I've been kind of concerned with that. Like, I'm not done here yet. Like I'm, I, you know, I graduate in May. So it's like, are companies even going to be willing to discuss me coming over there after I graduate? Or is that like, you know, I'm just in this like weird kind of like phase. Yeah, I think what I would do if I were you is start um, like a spreadsheet of what companies you're interested in and then really get detailed information about like what jobs they have open and information about them where you think you have a specific reason that they would be interested in you and like start kind of crafting what you would reach out to them with. So you could even have like email set up like blah, 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 this is me. I saw that you did X, Y, Z. I was really impressed. And here's a link to more about me or my portfolio or whatever, because I think that my skill matches that like very specific, not just I like your company. I'm interested in working for you. Okay. It was all geared up. And then maybe more like April or even the beginning of May, like send them all out then so that if they have a job open, because people will, like, I see resumes sometimes where I'm like, oh, that's such a great resume. I wish we had something available for that person. I'll file it away. It's never, fun. like, I've never gone back to one of those people, even with the best of intentions. So it does, unfortunately, have to be, like, in the right moment to get that. So, um, you know, starting in May, leaked out, reach out to people both on, like, their, you know, their sites to, for jobs, but also, um reach out to people via LinkedIn, try to figure out who the hiring manager of that role would be, stalk them via connections on what's on LinkedIn, and then try to reach out to them directly, not just through the HR. Okay. Good luck. Okay, that well, helps a lot. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. I don't know if you can answer this question, but I feel like for the students that are thinking of moving, making a move to the UK, how challenging is it from a visa perspective? I mean, if you're hiring people and you see talent in New York, I assume. Yeah. Um, good question. I think you, I think for an entry level job, we probably wouldn't um, sponsor a visa for someone to move over. Not for entry level. Yeah. So it's almost like you need to get a visa some other way, some <laughs> other way, and then and then come. Um, Even if you get like a, a six month visa and come over and interview in person, and then like or yeah, then maybe. But we're not going to move somebody. Like we're not going to pay relocation. Like move somebody from New York. Yeah. Can I um, comment on that? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, I actually have my sister and her husband are stationed in London right now. Um, he's in the Air Force. So I was planning on staying with them. So I would have some, like someone to stay with over there so I could interview in person. Um, but also I'm trying to get a student visa to go to a master's program over there. So if I have that, then I feel like it'll be a lot easier because I'll be able to work. But it's, I'm worried about the, you know, like, if I don't get in, trying to still move over there. So, yeah. but, like, your advice was really helpful. Yeah. yeah. I don't know that much about the visas because yeah. the situation was different. So. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, students, any more questions? All right. Um, Laura has um, a great piece for, for closing class today. <laughs> 
Yes. Okay. So I am going to move really far away from what we've been talking about. But I have two really important stories that I want to tell you that I hope will help you on your journeys, even if they have nothing to do with fashion or marketing. Okay? <laughs> so just get comfy. Okay. So I'm going to tell you these the two most important stories of my life. So the first one starts way back when I was in junior high school, I think I was 14, and I saw a documentary about tsunamis. And back then, like people didn't really know what tsunamis were because there hadn't, there hadn't been like a big one in a long time. I mean, now everyone knows what they are, but it was like rare. People, some people knew, but a lot of people had never heard of them. But for some reason, this documentary like really got into my head, like it messed with me. And I became weirdly paranoid about tsunamis. And um, I started having dreams about them where I would be like freaking out because I could see a wave coming. And it was just like this weird thing about me. So people would ask me, like, tell me something, you know, like, what's something I don't know about you? I would say like, oh, I'm really afraid of tsunamis. And everyone would kind of laugh. Okay. So flash forward to, I'm 28, I'm in grad school, and at the end of my fall term, uh, a group of us went on a study trip to Singapore and Thailand, and um, a professor of economics went, went with us, like, to chaperone us or whatever, and we, at the end of our trip, we went to Phuket, and when we were driving there, I was like, oh, this is an island. I'm really afraid of tsunamis. Like, what, what is the percent chance of me dying in a tsunami? And he laughed at me and he was like, you have less than a 0% chance of dying in a tsunami. So then after that part of the trip, most people went home for Christmas, but a group, a smaller group of us went on and we went to Koh Phi Island and spent Christmas there. And we just like had a blast. The weather was amazing. It was great. Um, and we were scheduled to leave on December 26, 2004. So that morning, I was in our bungalow with my good friend, like kind of boyfriend, James, and we were packing to leave. And all of a sudden, the lights went out and there was a rumble. And I looked out of our bungalow window and I couldn't see the ocean because it was like our bungalow and then another bungalow and then the beach. But all of a sudden I saw a wall of water exploding through the bungalow in front of ours. I reached out for James and the feeling when that hit is hard, it's like hard to describe. I've, I have fortunately never been thrown against a brick wall, but like I imagine that that's what it feels like. It's nothing like a normal wave at all. Um, and for about 30 seconds, uh, my body was tossed around underwater and then I came to rest, but I was under debris, heavy debris that I couldn't move and I was underwater. And at first I thought, well, this is insane. Like, is this just one of my dreams? But in my dreams, I was never actually in the tsunami. Like I'd always wake up right before it hit. And so I knew that it was real. And I was underwater for three minutes. So most of you have probably never held your breath for three minutes. Um, it's incredibly painful. Like the pain in your lungs, it burns like, like nothing else. And I held my breath as long as I could until everything sort of started to go spotty in my vision. Um, and then eventually I couldn't, I couldn't not breathe in anymore. So I breathed in water. Um, but at that moment, the debris shifted and I, I was able to fight my way up and I got a breath of air. But the tsunami was still pushing across the island. So I don't know if you've ever been to Koh Phi Island, but it's only half a mile wide in the middle. Um, and so the water was rushing over the island and I, I came up and I, I tried to keep my head up against the water, but it was 
it was really hard. And um, at one point, I looked up and there was a hotel in front of me and it it had been washed, the bottom had been washed through and the front of it had all but ripped away. So it was like a dollhouse. And there was a man standing on, on the first floor and he, he reached his arm down as I was rushing past and he grabbed me and I thought that he was gonna be able to pull me up and that I would be safe, but it was too strong and he let me go and I kept going. So the waves sort of dumped me out on the opposite beach and I tried to stand up, but I fell down and I looked down and just a huge hunk of my leg from knee to ankle was hanging off the bone. Um, and somehow my sarong was still on, which is amazing. And so I like took all the, the muscle and sinew and stuff and I put it back on the bone and I tied it up with my sarong because somehow I thought that like a doc, like I'd get rushed to the hospital and they'd be able to like sew it back on, um, which by the way is not the way it works at all. Um, so there was no sign of James and the next few hours were just like this terrible montage of, um, you know, I was taken to a hotel room and put on a bed with other survivors and the woman who was next to me died next to me. Um, and eventually I was taken to an evacuation zone. Um, and it, at first my body was in shock, but then the shock started to wear off. And the shock, the shock was great because during the shock I couldn't really feel anything. But once it wore off, it was just like excruciating. Like it made childbirth seem like nothing. Um, my right leg was the worst, but I had like a fist size hole in the back of my left leg um, that was missing and my deep cuts on my arms and everything. Um, so after, in 15 hours, I received no medical care, no painkillers. Finally, I was helicoptered to this hospital um, in Krabi, but it was totally overflowing. Um, and I was really late in the game in the day. So there were no beds left. There were people lying on the ground and they took me to surgery. But of course there was a huge line of surgery. So it's just like left outside for hours on a gurney. Um, and obviously at all that time, I didn't know anything about where James was and I, I it was terrible. And I was medevaced to a hospital in Bangkok where I had painful surgeries every day. Then I flew back to California with a doctor and I was in the hospital for two more months. Um, I got addicted to morphine after being on a morphine drip for two months. And one time a doctor was doing a procedure on me and because I was already addicted to morphine, he had to give me fentanyl so that I wouldn't feel it. And he OD'd me actually. And then I had to get Narcan. That was, that was pretty awful. And, uh, when they finally did release me from the hospital, they had to do like a step down program to get me off of morphine. And that was almost as bad as the tsunami. And I have like total, I, I totally understand drug addicts, it's horrible. And so every day that went by without finding James just made his death more certain. And so now on top of all my physical pain, I had survival guilt and I, I, I just thought like it should have been it should have been me, not him, because he was this great guy and he was gonna like set the world on fire. And it was just awful. I had PTSD, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat. I lost 30 pounds in a month. And um, finally in April, James' body was found and he had drowned along with 4,000 other people on Kopiki and 230,000 worldwide. So that remains sort of the worst, most traumatic, most unlucky thing that's ever happened to me, something I wish I could forget. Okay, so that was the first story, all true. So now I'm gonna tell you a second story, all true. When I was young, I watched a documentary about tsunamis, so I knew what they were. So when the tsunami hit, I knew what was happening when others didn't. I jumped up on the bed. I took a deep breath. When it hit, my lungs were full of air. James was looking up at me saying, what? He had exhaled. 
how lucky is it that I saw that documentary, that I knew what are the odds it saved my life. And when I was underwater, when I was pinned down, the debris shifted at just the right time for me to avoid dying. So a few seconds more and I would have drowned. But if it had lifted a few seconds earlier, I still would have drowned. Because like I said, the water was going across Kopipi Island. And so many people died because they were swept all the way across and out into the ocean. I got up just in time to get dumped 50 yards from the ocean's edge. I landed perfectly. And when I landed, I landed next to a palm tree and a life jacket. So I put on the life jacket. And when the third wave hit, I was holding on to the palm tree with a life jacket on. Again, I got so lucky. And then in the next 15 hours, I got to witness firsthand like the most amazingly heroic and selfless acts that normally you only see on TV. So basically, there were two hills on Kopipi, and anyone who was up on those hills was okay. So once it seemed safe, all these people came down and started helping. And there were people from all nationalities and all different languages, like working together to help us. And it was also like hysterical because, you know, nobody had, there was no cell phones, there was no internet, no one knew what to do. And so listening to these people try to figure out what to do based on like old episodes of ER was hysterical. So I remember somebody saying like, oh yeah, we need to make a better tourniquet for her leg. And someone was saying, no, no, remember that episode of ER where they did that and then they had to amputate? Like it was just, it, it was amazing to get to, to get to watch this. And people had superhuman strength. So the evacuation zone was back on this, the, the end of the island that I started at. So it was half a mile across, but now that half a mile was covered in debris and broken houses and hotels and stuff. And so the people were knocking doors off of the hotels and using them as stretchers and carrying us back to the evacuation zone. And each trip took like an hour for them to get there. But they joked. I was one of the later people to get moved and the it was six guys and their arms were shaking and you could tell and their legs were all cut up from going through the debris, but they were trying to laugh with me. They were telling me jokes, trying to keep my spirits up. Like it was so amazing. And it just felt, I don't know. I felt very like loved in the moment. <laughs> and, um, and there was a couple other classmates from my business school there that day and they were out far enough. They were scuba diving and they were out far enough that they were safe. And so they swam back to shore and they helped me and they advocated for me. They found me in the evacuation zone. And by that point, uh, by the time I got to the evacuation zone, there were like a few medical personnel there that had been brought from the mainland. Um, there were no, there were still no painkillers or anything, but they were there to triage. And at that point, I wasn't considered a very high priority because I didn't have a spinal injury or a head injury. But my friend Stefan was there and he kept advocating for me because my leg it was starting to turn black around the edges um, and I was getting feverish. So I got the very last seat in the last helicopter that left that night. If I had not gone on that helicopter, I likely would have died because I had septicemia, which is blood poisoning. And that's like a fast killer if you're not treated. So if I hadn't gotten antibiotics that night, I would have died. And then once I was in this like kind of crab hospital, but then I got to be medevaced to this hospital in Bangkok, which is like the top medical hospital in the world. And we had gone to it on our study trip to study medical tourism. And because of that, one of my classmates called the COO of the hospital and they held a room open for me in ICU. So I was the last one to get a room in ICU there. And I got amazing medical treatment. And then my mom came to visit me in Bangkok for two weeks. Uh, not visit, that's not the right word. She came to take care of me. And she was in heaven. Not just because I had survived, but because she had me totally captive. So <laughs> there were no iPads. I, I think I had like one book. So she just talked and talked and talked at me the whole time. And even though at the time it was really annoying because I just wanted like to have peace, looking back, it was like this very special time that I spent with her. And I learned a lot of family history and stories that I, I never would have learned. And I'm grateful for that.
And then when I came back to California, the doctors told me that I would never walk again, walk normally again. But I said, no way, not if there's a way around it. I will figure out a way I will walk again. And while sitting in a hospital for two months was really boring, I had 364 classmates minutes away that came and just like kept me company all the time. Now, if I hadn't been in school and everyone had been working, that wouldn't have worked out as well. And I missed a whole term of school, but I had tons of help from my classmates and my professor. So my final term, I took seven classes and PT and OT three times a week each. And after months, first in a wheelchair and then on crutches, I was able to walk across the stage for our graduation together. And then years later, when I had a son, I named him James because I never want to forget that. So those are my two stories. When you are a marketer, you understand very well the power of storytelling. We spend hours and days and months coming up with just the right story for customers. How do you tell the story of this spring line? What makes this cashmere sweater worth 10 times the amount that you can tell it by at Macy's? You'd spend all this time trying to craft that story. But how much time do you spend crafting your own story? How much effort do you spend on that? And to be clear, I'm absolutely not talking about social media. I am talking about the story that you tell yourself. We frame products in a certain way to influence how our audiences feel about it, but we also frame our own lives and how we craft that story has tremendous power to change how we think and feel about ourselves and our world. And then that influences the decision make and who we become. So I could have chosen to tell myself my story the first way. And believe me, I had many dark days where that's what I chose. For the first year after my graduation, I clung to that story. I was unlucky. I deserved sympathy. My life was a nightmare. But ultimately, I decided that the second story was the one that I wanted to live with. Because if I had stuck with the first story, that I would be branding myself a victim, and once you've done that, you're more likely to see yourself in other situations as a victim, even if that's not true. But by choosing, <coughs> excuse me, by choosing to tell myself that I was lucky, that I was brave, that I was hardworking, well, that's the life that I created. And I'm sure a lot of you have also had total tragedies in your life that have turned you upside down. And then all of us have experienced setbacks and disappointments. But there's always a choice of what story you're going to tell about. And it's not just for the big things either, it's for the little things because they happen every day. So if your professor is being demanding and you think a deadline is unrealistic, you can choose the story that they're being unfair, that it's impossible to please them, why did you take this course? Or you can choose to frame it as the ability to step up, prove yourself, challenge yourself. It sounds trite, I totally get that it sounds trite, but it's trite for a reason. So what I wanna leave you with today is a request that in this next year of school for you, you really think about your story. It takes hard work and constant work to shape and change it the way you want, but if you put in the work, it will have a positive change on your life now and for the rest of your life. So that's what I wanna leave you with. That was amazing. <laughs> Thank you. And I think it's exactly the message we all need in the middle of COVID right now, because you're totally right. Everyone has had a crap year, <laughs> but it is the way that you're going to spend this time and the, the silver linings that you find in it that are going to set you apart. So thank you for sharing that with us. You're welcome. It's great. And thank you for being here and answering all of our questions. Um, I hope you have a great evening. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks to all of you for listening to this. Really appreciate it. And best of luck to all of you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, students, I have a Thank survey you. coming your way that I'm going to put in the chat. Feel free to say anything else if you wanted to, but I just want to let you know that's coming your way. One second. <laughs> what a terrifying story. I know. <laughs> it really is. I would say a tsunami. One second here.
here. For some reason, this is, there we go. Copy. Okay. It's in the chat for you guys. Sorry about my dog. I think you like the story too. <laughs> That's why it's working. <laughs> Uh, guys, actually, this, this survey is my mid-semester check-in with you guys, and it is um, anonymous, so I, I should have deleted the comment about leaving your full name. Uh, I will be taking attendance from the log today, um, but don't feel very free to be very, very honest with me. I want your honest feedback so that I can improve the class for you for the rest of the semester and for future semesters. So appreciate hearing all your commentary and make sure it's anonymous, unless you don't want to. That's your choice, too. But. There's no place to put your name. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great Thank week. You, Thank you. Bye.